Hey, welcome back to Antisocial Studies. I'm Emily Glankler, and I want to talk to you about how to tackle the multiple choice questions in any of your AP history classes. We're going to talk about APUSH, AP World, and AP Euro. It's all the same strategy. The multiple choice question is the single biggest section of your AP exam, but it's also probably the type of question you're going to see the most throughout your school year, as your teacher probably will give you unit exams that have these AP style multiple choice questions. So on the AP exam, you're going to get 55 multiple choice questions in 55 minutes, and it's 40% of your test score. Across all the AP history classes, the multiple choice look the same. You're going to get a stimulus that could be an excerpt from a written document. It could be an image. It could be a piece of art, whatever. And then you're going to get a set of questions, normally three or four that go along with it. These AP style multiple choice questions are probably different from any other type of history multiple choice question you've ever seen, right? A lot of us are used to the traditional style of question, which is just a question that has one clear right answer. And it's typically a fact you had to have memorized before you even started taking the test. Some of us have also taken tests that are more like reading comprehension, where we might get a document and then we can like discover or find the answer in that document without really having to have studied at all in advance. These AP style questions, they're not either of those types. They're actually a mix of both, which make them kind of extra complicated. Typically, you need to do both things. You need to know some information going in. You need to have just studied and know some historical facts. And also, you need to be able to read and interpret and understand the document, put those things together to discover what the rightest answer is out of the four choices. Okay, so what's the strategy? The first thing I think that you should always look at is you should just skim the questions that you're gonna have to answer before you dive into the document. It can be really tempting to just start reading the document word for word, but a lot of these are like very old documents. They might be really confusing and you don't wanna get stuck. You have to go through these questions relatively quickly. I always suggest that you skim the questions beforehand. Don't go all the way into all the answer choices, that gets too overwhelming, but just get an idea of what type of information you're looking for before you go into the document. Then you're gonna go in and read your stimulus. Now, the only part of each document or stimulus that you wanna read word for word is the source information and any sort of title or other information that they give you. For example, the source information might tell you the name of the book it's from or the author. It might tell you some background information about that author. If you're looking at an image, you wanna look at the title of the map or the title of the image and any other little asterisks and descriptions that they give you. A lot of times, like 60% of the information you need can be found in that source material. Material. Then, assuming you've already looked at the questions and you have a general idea of what kind of information you're looking for, you want to skim the document. Skim through the whole thing, right? Sometimes the first half of it might be saying one thing and then the second half might like flip the script. You want to make sure you don't misinterpret the document. But generally, skim past details that are especially confusing to you. So if you get hit with a document that has a lot of names or that has a lot of hyper-specific information that you don't really know about, don't get too stressed about it. Skim on past it and get through all the information so that at least you understand the main idea of the document before you go back and look at the questions in more detail. So now, how do you figure out what the best answer choice is? And I guarantee there is always only one right answer. These questions are built to where typically you're going to narrow it down to maybe two, and it's going to seem a lot of times like both answers could be right but it's not. There's only ever one answer. You just have to pick the one that most directly corresponds to the question you're being asked. Process of elimination is going to be your best friend here. Really like the first step is if you can eliminate at least one or ideally two answer choices right off the bat before you get too confused, that's ideal. And how do you know if an answer choice is wrong? Well, it's one of two things. It's either just straight up historically inaccurate. It's a statement that just you're like, yeah, that did not happen. That did not happen in this era or just didn't happen at all. Or it might be a true statement, an accurate, historically accurate statement, but it has really nothing to do with the question that you're being asked. Just cross those out, move on, never think about them again. Probably most likely you're going to get down in most questions to two answer choices. Now, first of all, if you're looking and your gut is really pushing you towards one answer, I would just pick that, especially if you've studied, if you prepare for the test, your gut is probably telling you something that you maybe just can't remember off the top of your head. Pick it and move on. But what happens if you get stuck between two answer choices? How do you know which one to choose? I mean, it's easier said than done, but picking the correct answer just means picking the answer choice that the most directly responds to both the question you're being asked and the stimulus that they gave you. 
Now, if you've narrowed it down to two answer choices, you've already done most of the work. You're putting yourself in a really good situation. This is the real key when you're taking the AP exam, the multiple choice section, or when you're even taking your unit test. Any test that's timed, you just have to psychologically prepare yourself to make a kind of educated guess and then move on. That is honestly the best strategy that I can give you. When in doubt, if you get down to two or three answer choices and you're like, I gotta jump ship, I just gotta make my best guess and then move to the next question. When in doubt, choose the answer choice that connects more closely to the question first. Now, if you're like, uh, both of these seem to connect to the question, okay. Which one connects more closely to just the document that they gave you? For example, try to use themes here. If the document is kind of themed around like society and social class and you're down to two answer choices, pick the one that just has more to do with society and social class, if you can. And step three, this is your last resort. If you were like, I still genuinely don't know and I just have to guess and move on. Rather than just picking your favorite letter and saying, I'm gonna pick B for all of them. No, of the answer choices that are left, pick the answer choice that is the most vague. Now, I'm not at all saying that this should be your strategy for every single question. This is your last resort. But generally, the more specific that an answer choice gets, the more opportunities there are for it to be wrong, right? This is something that trips a lot of students up. You might have an answer choice that sounds really good and you're reading through it and you're going, oh man, all of these things sound like the right answer. They're historically accurate. They connect to the question. But then you get to one specific detail where you go, ah, well, that's not right. If one part of the answer choice is wrong, then the whole answer choice is wrong. So again, if you just need to guess and move on, pick the answer choice that's saying something more general, more vague, the less specific it is, the more likely it can apply to whatever question that they're asking you. Okay, let's jump into an example. I wanted to pick a document that could apply and that could in theory show up in AP Euro, AP World, and AP US History. So I chose the Declaration of Sentiment. So first, let's just skim the question we're gonna have to answer. It's asking us, this document is best understood in the context of which of the following historical developments? So this is the good news. If we skim that question first, then we know we do not actually need to dive too deep into the document yet. We just need to get an idea of what the document is generally to be able to answer this first question. So we're gonna read our source information word for word. This is the Declaration of Sentiments. It's a document signed by 68 women and 32 men at the Seneca Falls Convention in New York, 1848. Now I'm just gonna skim to get an idea of what the contents of this document are. Now. You might already know what this document is, and if so, great, you could probably go back to question one and answer it, but let's pretend that we've never seen this document before. I'm gonna skim. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. Great, I already kind of get the big idea. Now at this point, I'm just gonna skim past the rest of it to make sure that I'm not missing something big in the second half. They're created equal, endowed with rights, life, liberty, happiness, I know all this stuff, the patient sufferance of the women, it's now necessary to demand equal station. All right, it's just a women's rights document. Great. Now let's go back to the question and read the question one more time. This document, this women's rights document, right, is best understood in the context of which of the following 19th century historical developments. Again, if you look through A, B, C, and D and you feel like your gut, you're like, I feel 75% sure that you already know what the answer is, Great, pick it and move on. But let's walk through the process of if you weren't quite sure what the answer would be. Step one is process of elimination. And the simplest one here, right? They're asking us about which of the following 19th century historical developments. Well, we could look through first and just see, are any of these historical developments just not true? Were they just not things that were happening in the 19th century? So we have the influence of decolonization efforts in Africa and Asia. Uh, yeah, that one has to be wrong. Decolonization is not happening in the 1800s. The 1800s is the age of imperialism. Decolonization isn't happening until the late 20th century. So without even understanding this document at all, we can eliminate an answer choice because it's just a historically inaccurate statement. Great. Spread of enlightenment ideals to historically marginalized groups. That sounds good. That sounds like a potential answer. I'm going to leave it. Industrialization that is happening in the 19th century. The growing influence of Marxist political theories on cla of class struggle. That's also happening in the late 1800s, but uh, this is really the mid. So I'm for sure crossing out A. I'm like hesitant. D seems wrong. B and C both seem like they're the most likely answers. Okay, so now let's look back at the document and think about if we're just down to B and C, realistically, which of these more closely relates to the contents of this document? 
So B, we have the spread of enlightenment ideals to historically marginalized groups. That makes sense. Women are a historically marginalized group. And this document is an enlightened document. It's talking about natural rights, life, liberty, and property, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that sort of thing. But just for the sake of it, let's look at C. Industrialization is breaking apart traditional family structures. That's true. And leaving women in increasingly isolated domestic roles. This is a really great example of a distractor answer because C is a true statement that is happening. It is a way that industrialization is impacting gender roles. It's impacting women, which, yeah, this document is a women's rights document. But do you see how they're just like talking on two different planes? They're both true statements, but C just really doesn't connect to the Declaration of Sentiments at all. Because if anything, the Declaration of Sentiments is not women being increasingly isolated. It's women actually like leaving the home and deciding that they want to demand more rights. I also want you to notice that B is the most general, the most vague of all the answer choices, right? They don't even say what historically marginalized group. They don't even say what enlightenment ideals, right? They're just saying the enlightenment spread to other groups. Great. We're going to pick B. That's the right answer and move on. Now, question number two is a really good example of that far end of the spectrum where there are times when the AP exam is just going to ask you questions that are as close to just a memorization question as we can get, right? And so you do just have to know some basic information and some basic names to be able to answer the question. The language used in this document was most directly inspired by the writings of Hobbes, Wollstonecraft, Locke, or Jefferson. This feels like a trap right? I can immediately eliminate Hobbes because if you know anything about Thomas Hobbes, he's not talking about equality of the genders and liberty and the government. Like he's talking about absolute monarchy. But B, C, and D all kind of make sense. We know that Mary Wollstonecraft was a feminist enlightenment writer. So that would probably be the one my gut would tell me to pick. We know John Locke was the guy talking about inalienable rights, but we also know Thomas Jefferson was also doing that. And he was doing it in the United States. So this is one that might make you pause. You see Mary Wollstonecraft, you think that's got to be the answer. She's a woman. But then you see John Locke and go, well, it could be him. And it also could be Jefferson. This is where we need to go back and read the question way more carefully. Because it's not just asking us this document is inspired by which of these people. Well, it's inspired by all three of them, right? It's asking about the language used in the document. Not the ideas in the document. Not the sentiments. But the declaration itself, how are they saying this thing? And if we go back and look, I mean, this is almost a word for word copy and paste from the U.S. Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. This entire document is basically plagiarized off of Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence. We just add in women. So even though Wollstonecraft, Locke and Jefferson all inspired this document in different ways, the language in the document is inspired most directly from Thomas Jefferson, D. Lastly, the AP exam likes to ask you to make inferences based on your other historical knowledge. And so it's asking you, based on the arguments in the passage, so not the language, but actually the thing that's being said, its authors would most likely also support. Okay, so now this is a really high level question. They're asking us to think about the point of view and the perspective of the authors of this document and take the arguments that they're making here and say, where else could we apply them? And where else could we assume that these authors might also apply them? Now, I wanna be super clear here. There are times when you might know more than the document gives you. Meaning you might, especially if you're in AP US history, you might know a lot about the Declaration of Sentiments. You might know a lot about the Seneca Falls Convention and all the people that were there. And you might want to draw on all that outside knowledge. But be careful because this question is saying just strictly based on the arguments we've given you in this document, what other movement might these same words and these same arguments apply to? Okay. So if we look through, the abolition movement makes sense. It's another enlightened kind of idea, the enlightenment spreading to marginalized groups. We're going to keep abolitionism around. Social Darwinism, now, I know some stuff about the women writers of this document, and that a lot of them were white women who very possibly might have believed in social Darwinism. But I want us to notice that social Darwinism doesn't really have anything to do with this document, right? Social Darwinism is all about hierarchy and people being above others, whereas this one's talking about equality. So this is an example where if you know some things about some of like the women's rights 
activists and their stance on, for example, uh, white people versus non-white people, Christians versus non-Christians, whatever, you could make the inference that some of them might have also been social Darwinists. But that's not coming from this document in any way. It's just coming from something else that you know. So we're still going to, we're going to cross out B. C, reforms to prevent government corruption. That makes a lot of sense. We also know that a lot of these Seneca Falls activists were also like reformers in other ways. A lot of this is talking about the government and the government's role. So we're going to keep C around. D, westward expansion. That just sort of has nothing to do with this document at all. We're going to cross it out. So we get down to abolition and government reforms. Both of them make sense. Both of them are related to the Enlightenment in some way. And both of them could be related to this document. We could see how the people who wrote this document would believe that a government's role is to represent the people. And so if a government is being corrupt, then we need to reform that and make sure that that's not happening anymore. But it's way more direct to say that this document that's all about equality would more directly support the abolition movement. This is a great example of two answer choices being potentially right. The authors of this document and even the arguments in this document could be used to support both abolition and government reforms. But if we look at the specific arguments and the language used in here, it's way more direct. It's a way shorter path to go from the words in this document to abolishing slavery, to establish equality, equal station of people, the right of life and liberty, right? That's a way shorter path than to take those same words and go to like, government finance reform, for example. So the answer is A, abolition. Okay, so let's say that you have unit tests that are all multiple choice. Let's say you're trying to get ready for the AP exam and the multiple choice section. What are some strategies? What should you do? Number one, you should start always by studying broad historical developments and trends, and then just be able to group and link specific events to those trends. Even a question that seems hyper-specific, like the John Locke, Mary Wollstonecraft, Thomas Jefferson question, is really asking you more about broader developments. Women in the United States using the American Revolution and applying it to their own situation. That's a big, broad development. And then Thomas Jefferson is just the very specific name that we need to have memorized. But if you know the broad development, then you're preparing yourself for more of the questions. Another strategy is you should be using the CED or the course and exam description to know the stuff you have to know. And I've linked here in the video these simplified CEDs that I've made. Basically it just takes word for word what the college board says you have to know and it makes sure that if there's a specific name or a specific document, for example, the APUSH CED says specifically that you need to know the Declaration of Sentiments. So if you're using that college board guide as your review guide, then you're not gonna be caught off guard with some document that you've literally never heard of before. And finally, as you're taking the test, especially a timed multiple choice test, remember that it's quantity over quality. You want to answer all 55 questions no matter what. So even if that means that you have to go a little bit more quickly through some of the questions, there might be a question where you're sitting there going, ah, if I sat here and really thought about it for five more minutes, I could figure it out. Don't do that. Make your best guess, maybe circle the questions so you can come back to it if you have time and move on. This is one of the biggest strategies that I work with my kids on is being willing to kind of cut ties with a question and move on because each question is worth the same one point. So a really difficult question that takes you five minutes to figure out is worth one point. But in those five minutes, you might have missed the opportunity to look at five easier questions that could have gotten you five points. Okay, I hope that was helpful. As always, like and subscribe to my YouTube channel and go follow me on TikTok and Instagram. Go check out my website, antisocialstudies.org. I'll be back to walk you through more elements of these AP history exams.